As you might expect, when totalitarianism comes to Imperial Japan, there's going to be a fundamental difference between the way that totalitarianism comes to a country like Russia or a country like Italy, or later we'll talk about Germany. Japan is different from all three. Japan, remember, is an ancient society uh, founded in the mists of antiquity by Jibu Tenu and his invading people driving out the Ainu up to Hokkaido Island. Japan harkens back to the first Yamato state, where the first god emperor is proclaimed, a lineal descendant of the sun goddess Amaterasu Omikami. Japan is the land of the awake and alive gods, the kami. Not kami, C-O-M-M-I-E, but kami, K-A-M-I. Divine spirits that wise Japanese, through the wisdom of Shinto, can listen to and communicate with. The Japanese are blessed among all people as, as being residents of the land of the awakened gods. And they are led themselves by a god emperor. Now this tradition is bolstered by the fact that the god emperor doesn't always have to be the ruler. In fact, throughout much of late ancient and medieval Japanese history, uh, and into early modern history, uh, the Japanese state is ruled by a military dictator, a shogun, who is chief of the samurai, the Japanese knightly class. The shogun rules while the emperor reigns. But all of this changes after the arrival of Commodore Matthew Perry, beginning the uniquely intimate relationship between modern Japan and the United States of America. As a result of Perry's intervention, opening up Japan uh, to foreign trade and contact, the Tokugawa shogunate falls, and Japanese society is reoriented to become more Western than the Westerners, because Perry's arrival proves to them that the Tokugawa's completely failed at the primary mission of the Japanese state, which is to protect and reverence the god emperor. They understand that with the weapons that the Americans had in that single battle squadron, they could have flattened Tokyo or invaded the imperial palace and taken the god emperor prison or, God for, God's forbid, even kill him. So the Japanese are going to take an opposite route to the Chinese in the 19th century, and instead of resisting the foreign devils as mere barbarians, the Japanese are going to become, they're going to reinvent themselves. They're going to become more Western than the Westerners. But this is a superficial thing. Japanese society involves people wearing several masks at several levels. Each mask, the deeper you go, the more intimate it becomes, the more personal it becomes. But the true face of a person is only shown to intimate loved ones within family circumstances. And that's only certain aspects of the individual person. Modern Japan, from the time of Commodore Perry's uh, visit in the 1850s, is this balancing act. It seems like a battle to us, but it's actually an interesting harmonization between tradition and modernity. The traditions of the samurai are sacrificed, while most samurai become leaders in the new institutions, westernized institutions, that are being built. The Japanese invite a Prussian army officer to make Japan's imperial army based on the most successful modern European army, that of Prussia. The uh, navy is going to be designed and led by uh, British officers who come in and form an alliance with the Japanese. Um, so the Japanese army is going to have aspects of tradition plus aspects of the Prussian military tradition, and the Japanese navy is going to have aspects of Japanese tradition harmonized with British naval traditions. Uh, businesses are established by Americans, um, in general, the Japanese go to the Westerners who are best in their fields 
in order to make Japan strong. And Japan becomes very strong, strong enough to start spanking the Qing dynasty of China in the late 1800s and early 1900s. In 1894, they fight the Chinese and become another European-style treaty power, sending gunboats up Chinese waters and treating Chinese like second-class citizens in their own country. In 1904, ten years later, uh, the Japanese fight the Russians and defeat them at sea and on land, again and again and again. The Treaty of Portsmouth gives Japan much, but not all, of what it wanted. In 1914, 20 years after the Sino-Japanese War, the Japanese, as a part of the coalition of allies in World War I, scoop up all the German colonies on the Chinese coast and in the Pacific north of the equator. The Aussies get what's south of the equator. Throughout this time, the cult of the god emperor, particularly the Meiji emperor, who presides over this throughout most of the 18 and very early 1900s, the emperor Meiji is reestablished as the head of the government and the head of the nation. He is chief executive. He is going to have a prime minister. But his power is this odd combination of legal absolute total supremacy, practical absolute total supremacy, and also a hands-off approach that's going to allow his ministers to work for him in their own ways. But everything, everything is the possession of the God Emperor, and everything is done in the name of the God Emperor. And if the God Emperor says something definitive, it's going to change, it's going to happen. So, state Shinto, Shinto being the traditional, animistic, polytheistic, pagan religion of Japan, which tells how the emperor is divine, is going to be taught in every Japanese school to succeeding generations. The Kojiko and a series of other myths that uh, justify the uh, Shinto belief is going to be taught in the schools. The divinity of the emperor is going to be taught in the schools. And remember the imperial rescript on education, which I read to you, which basically says the purpose of schools are to bring our land together so that we, the emperor, may be royal. We, we may be proud and happy and that our realm will be glorified by your dedication and efforts. Public education is universal, so the teaching of state Shinto beliefs is universal, and all men are drafted into the military for a period of service, so universal conscription is going to combine with state Shinto uh, public education to produce a people that are remarkably uh, homogenized in terms of their belief systems. Everyone understands that the order of being includes their existence as human beings as aspects of the imperial body as aspects of the imperial will this is taking thomas uh, this is taking hobbes notion of the leviathan and shintoizing it to a point where it is believed the great glory of the Japanese people in modern times is their ability as a nation to turn 90 degrees on a dime, which they do when they drop the shogunate and embrace the uh, Meiji Restoration. Um, and later, at the end of World War II, when they drop militarism and embrace Americanism. But all on the surface. Because the Japanese encounter Europe during its most aggressive late 19th century imperial phase, that is considered to be part of being modern. So, the Prussianized Japanese army is going to be aggressive. The training program of conscripts is absolutely brutal, designed to create a deep sense of rage that officers and sergeants can call upon in battle and in occupation, so that the Japanese soldier of the imperial era becomes uh, synonymous with absolute vicious violence and brutality. Barely controlled, barely contained. This is on purpose. It makes the Japanese army have great spirit as they see it, and even though their weapons are a bit backward, 
their technology a bit lower than its European equivalents. They believe that the spirit of the Japanese soldier and their willingness to sacrifice for the God Emperor is going to overcome any material weakness. The idea of an expanding, ever-expanding imperial state is also from this period of acute Western imperialism. Either the empire is expanding or it's dying. There is no stability. There is no point of balance. It is expand or die, expand or die. And this notion of a militarized Japan continually expanding to include its neighbors is going to be the scourge of East Asian history in the late 18 and early 1900s. When a soldier goes to war, and we'll talk about this more in World War II, the family and the soldier and the friends basically consider the soldier's life to be over. The soldier's life is given to the God Emperor. It is only for the God Emperor to give that life back to the soldier at the point of discharge. And not everyone is expected to live to be discharged. What's expected is that you will live and die for the God Emperor with total dedication and without holding back at all. The kind of dedication that St. Ignatius of Loyola talked about Jesuits having to the Lord God Almighty in a Roman Catholic context is what the Japanese soldier, every Japanese soldier, is expected to have for the God Emperor. They are dead men. They are not trying to live through these wars. They are trying to spend their lives in service of the God Emperor to expand Japan. Finally, in the interwar period between World Wars I and II, as Japan becomes more and more totalitarian, as the military gets more and more control, the Tokubetsu Koto Kaisatsu are developed. Tokubetsu, koto kaisatsu, basically means the thought police. They call themselves the thought police. And the thought police are set up uh, throughout Japanese society to spy on everyone who is in Japanese society, both the newly conquered colonies and the people in the homeland. Because living under a god emperor, not being sufficiently uh enthusiastic is a thought crime the japanese traditions allow their society to be remarkably totalitarian because the emperor's power is without limit in the west even in russia there is this accretion of christianity and greco-roman individualism that totalitarianism needs to break through Japan has a wondrous ancient society, but it is a society where the community comes first and always has one of the reasons why the family name comes before the person's name. Uh, it is actually Admiral uh, Yamamoto Isoroku, uh, rather than how he is pronounced in the American uh, historical sources, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. Yamamoto is his last name, but it's said first in Japanese. It's because the group comes first. And Confucian ideas from Chinese society that are imported, combined with Shinto ideas that say we are one, really make Japanese society before 1945 remarkably totalitarian. More to come.